So, so here's an interesting thought as I, I see the three of you brilliantly playing in the moment here. Uh, we talked with Tim a little earlier about his first experience coming here, and he was a dude with a guitar and a Marshall amp and not a whole lot else. Hmm. You know? And then you get, I think, to the, the gear that probably Eric and I would have grown up with, which is kind of this middle road between the original tube amps and some new technology sort of doing stuff. And then where you're at, Madison, which you got to grow up with kind of all of it, mm. which like I wish I had some of this stuff when I was growing up, like in this little pedal, like, oh, I can just sound like this amp. And I, I think there's a, a thing we feel like, I wish I could have this sound or I wish I had this. And you kind of can have everything now. Mm. So how do you distill what you need 
to start playing that day? What is your minimum requirement? Like, well, if I have this sound and this guitar, I'm good. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I've, I've barely scratched the surface in terms of everything that's out there because it's an overwhelming amount mm. of information and it's, a, you know, it's just a, it's an endless catalog. But I do feel like for me, you know, tone is, um, is kind of everything. It's like the, making sure that I feel like I sound like myself and, um, you know, it's, 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 um, I feel like I, I, I end up with gear that is very inexpensive and I can't explain why it is that I have, you know, form an attachment to a guitar or an amp or, or a pedal or whatever it is, but it's like that, that sort of relationship is, um, is everything. And again, it's a, it's a bit indescribable. Sometimes you just pick something up and you're like, there's a song in this and I feel like I can, I can hit a, I can afford to hit a wrong note. Anytime a guitar makes me feel like that or a pedal or whatever, I feel, um, I don't know, I feel like invincible in a way, because you're like, nothing can, it means that your curiosity is in full force and you just want to follow that thing no matter what it takes to, you know, get to that end. I think for me, I, um, I usually just like to have like a small amp of some sort, probably, I usually like play through a Princeton and, um, and just, yeah, I, I, I kind of keep my pedal, my pedal situation pretty minimal and, and um, try to find the melody in, in the, on the fretboard. That's an interesting topic. Do you think that comes from the fact that you're also the singer, writer, leading, you're the center of your band, really? Hmm. So I think if you stop playing, everything stops. Right. Where I, it's, there seems to be a comfort thing. Like if, I guess if maybe it is the fact that your, your brain knows, like, well, this is what I need to be comfortable, and then you can get back to actually creating. Totally, totally, and also like I, I'm not, you know, th thinking of playing in terms of um, sort of accompanying something. I'm accompanying mm -hmm. myself. You are, yeah, right. But it's, um, you know, I'm not like, h how can I make myself sound like a? I mean, that's not always true. I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm, I've entered this phase of being more fascinated with pedals. But my initial purist thing was like, just figure out how to sound good without any of it strip it all away and I felt like that helped me find um I don't know my footing and my sound and it, it helped me find a lot of gaps in my playing for sure one of the things Tim and I were talking about a little while ago as far as using effects and and finding sounds is also it can inspire not only a better performance, but in certain cases, a new part or a new song. Yeah. It can literally and, cr create the part <coughs> that you play because yeah. you're just responding to it. Yeah. And I've noticed with, with your, I'm a big fan, by the way, which I've probably told mm -hmm. you before, but some of the cool kind of feedback and distorted sounds that you yeah. get, which is such a cool juxtaposition with like this angelic voice. Um, mm -hmm. But beyond that, have you, because do you write songs like, on your electric with the amp cranked and stuff like do you let that inspire um ideas or is that kind of like you sit with an acoustic and write the song and then let that inspire okay. how you play it well i live in an, an apartment and there's a neighbor <laughs> above me <laughs> oh, okay. so there's like limitations yeah. on how yeah, much yeah. I, oh, but gosh, that yes. is really yeah. i think you you hit something there like that is my happy place is when yeah. i'm able to turn up my amp to as loud as I can stand it and I just am able to like sing into the room. I think that I'm, a, I'm, I'm much more of a reactive player. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that certainly inspires ideas. I can like sort of ping pong off of, off of that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it, it, I would much rather that. I just don't yeah. always have the situation. So a lot of times I'll be playing on acoustic guitar and then, you know, figuring things out, figuring parts out sort of with, without removed from effects or whatever, and then I'll insert it into, yeah. the, into the, the tone and the sound that I want. To me, the way I've always seen guitar is sort of a vehicle for a song. Yeah. And, um, and it's funny, I, I've, I've kind of also questioned myself and where I sort of exist in the guitar playing world, um, yeah. because I'm not necessarily like, you know, I can't like walk the fretboard necessarily. That's yeah. not necessarily my, the way my, my brain thinks about it. But I've noticed that you, um, I know we talked before once and you, you actually, at least some of the recordings are, are fully tracked live, right. am I right? Yeah, you're right. Um, so you're, it's, you're thinking about that in advance. Initially, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm also writing in terms of 
thinking of live shows and right, what right. that I don't know what the sort of arc of the set list needs and yeah, yeah, yeah. and how I can pull it off. With, I, you know, I've always worked on a budget too, so I'm like, how can I make this this song <laughs> sing with three three piece, you know, a three piece ensemble? And it's honestly, limitations are your best friend. Yeah. The things yeah. that it 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 makes you do. We were just talking about how now we have unlimited. Um, options totally. in the studio so now we have to kind of force those limit like i like to you know mess around on a four track and stuff just because mm -hmm. it'll make me you know I, I always go back to motown records and we, you talked a little mm -hmm. bit about that and all of those there was so much intention in every part because they're all playing together in a room you know and i think that mm -hmm. actually relates to you playing your, your track you know with your band live in the studio but sometimes i have to create those limitations on myself because all of a sudden oh i can do anything i can get any sound and i can play any synth i have every totally. plug-in and i've got a million tracks to work with um, so I think that's kind of an interesting thing now is that we have so many options that we can get like lost in it. Well, both of you guys are really smart in that way because you're artists and you have to reject like a thousand things and find the five things yeah. that make you unique and separate you. And you both right. do that. You both do it. When you um, go to record and you are faced with the idea that, you, that, that, that there are limitless options, have you ever made something where you've walked away and been like, I don't really know what this is because I used everything oh, at my disposal. And also, um, as a producer, I've worked with so many artists over the years, and especially younger artists that that know how to use Pro Tools or Ableton, yeah. and they'll be like, can I take the session home? And I used to be like, yeah, sure. And then they'll come back with like a thousand versions of everything and plugins, like 10 plugins on yeah. every track. And I'm like, but I, I and, and I get it because it's fun. It's yeah. fun to play around with these things, but then you can get lost. You can get lost. And it's so, um, discouraging when you when you don't know how to get out of it when yeah, something was yeah. like a pure idea that suddenly just gets riddled with all of your like you know your ideas that that turn into sometimes insecurities of like oh I don't want yeah. it to sound too much like this so I'm gonna pepper it with this or what you know what I mean and then you're you've got this like cocktail of of too, of you too many things. You a suicide cocktail. Yeah, when it's all about the ingredients being good and fresh. You know, the best yeah. cocktail has like two or three ingredients and they're just exactly. really good ones. Yeah. You know, but that was, it's refreshing to hear your music because I think I discovered at some point that I listened to one of your recordings and then I watched a live thing and I was like, that is the recording. I think there's one, mm. one of your songs where there's a video and yeah. it is the recording. I was oh, like, right. is that really? So she just tracked this live. This is so cool. And, um, in the modern day, there's not like a ton of that. I mean, it, it, I, I shouldn't say that. A lot of it exists, but a lot of the stuff that you come across, you know, you know on the radio or whatever, um, it's not just people in a room playing. It's not. A, it's not a priority. Again, I think it's it's a convenience thing too, right? Like I, you know, knowing that you can actually come away with a perfect take if you yeah. just like, you know, mess with it enough times, um, is liberating in a certain way. But I think the idea of needing to come into the studio totally like rehearsed so that you don't let the moment take down the song and the the feeling it taught me so much as a as a player and, and songwriter um but also just as a performer just yeah. understanding like this is the one moment that i have to play this song i don't have tw 20. yeah you know and i want to yeah. know how to like aim and and like hit the mark. You know? Well, that, historically, that's how great records were made. It was totally. capturing people in a moment. They got off the road, went in the studio, and yeah. got captured. Yeah. I want to know about your vibrato pedal. It's a custom signature vibrato it pedal. It is. Right? Yeah. I I just made it with JHS, and um, they had this pedal called um, the the Emperor. It's the purple pedal with the penguin on it, and. Um, when I was kind of just getting started and trying to find a home and and being you know a, an electric guitar player, I kind of came to JHS and that was the first place where I was like, ooh, I like the sound, and just started putting on everything. And I felt finally like I think this might be something that I feel like is a, you know a part of my playing now. And so he had the idea of making this sort of two-channel pedal that um, allows you to just kind of pick your, your vibrato speed on either one. So I can switch kind of mid-song. It's kind of a deeper vibrato. It could go a little bit more extreme. You know, yeah. I would never probably do that, yeah, but, but yeah, for, yeah. for example. 
But usually I have this on for for a whole set of music. I, I, I bring it with me everywhere. It just it, it gives a sort of light, um, seasick, nauseous sort of sound. <laughs> if people let me, I would leave my VB2 on all the time. Why too. don't it's you? It's my favorite. Thing. It makes my body feel know. different. Exactly. Like, I totally exactly. understand it. It's like, because I read this or I see it, saw an interview with you where you, and I didn't want to presume that you left it on all the time, but I understand. I'd leave that on all the time if I could. I do. Do you not then? No, no, because I, I, I do sessions and so people want different things all the time and yeah. sometimes it scares them to have the modulation. <laughs> so. Proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know that it was funny. I, I, I kind of made that choice and didn't realize that that was a, um, a sort of bold choice. Josh yeah. was like, I don't know anyone that does that. And I was like, oh, oh, well. Well, you don't really hear it. As a listener, you just hear a sound. I w if you hadn't told me that you were doing that, I would just, oh, that's her sound. Sounds really cool. I wouldn't have known because it's the mm -hmm. way you use it. Like you said, you never turn it up that fast. The trick with a vibrato mm -hmm. is making it really subtle and finding the musical place. Right? Yeah. So I wouldn't have even known. Just really use it well. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. What's? Can you tell me what's what's going on here? You've got some. This is. I built this too? for today. Oh, you really did. Yeah, uh, and and it turned out pretty good. Uh, it took some time though. So. The way I approach a pedal board is pretty simple. I have two or three pedals that add different styles of gain because the amp, we were talking about this earlier, there's a sweet spot on the amp and you can't really go past it or the amp doesn't sound at its best. So mm -hmm. these add more or less gain and shape the sound. And then the modulators I use very sparingly, tremolo. Uh, and then I always have a volume pedal between the gain pedals and the time based pedals mainly to hide noise hmm. um, because I record a yeah. lot and people love to have a quiet thing. So it's almost like a gas pedal with me. And then I just try and use these pedals sparingly so they become like event pedals rather than yeah. always on pedals. Yes. And I was t talking earlier, I use delay to make the guitar float and I always try and hide it much in the same way I was talking about your vibrato pedal. I don't want people to notice it's there. I just want delay to make the guitar float a little yeah. bit. So yes. that's, that's the simple answer. I feel like Daniel Lenoir does that a lot. Like he's got exactly. delay on all the time, but it's just like this exactly. sort of ghost light. Yeah, and it's the, the all the top end is rolled off and it has yeah. modulation. No, yeah. it's not quite like the edge where it's yeah, used yeah. as a very like yeah. syncopated, yeah, yeah. yeah. non-event yeah. pedal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a good way to say that. What about you? Are you you're rocking no pedals? I have no right pedals now? at the okay, moment. Well, I'm going into well, actually, that's not true. So I'm going into these UA pedals. What what's what am oh, I? Yeah, what is my on. setting at the moment? So you're you're on a basic the Dream uh, yeah. 65, and you've got a little bit of 224 as a reverb. Yeah, just a little splash of that, and that's kind of it. And you know what's interesting is there, and I, I, maybe all guitar players feel this. There are a lot of folks who don't feel comfortable unless they're on their guitar and their specific amp. And one interesting thing you did today was like, that's not even your guitar. You're like, yeah. no, no, I'll play this one. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. And you rolled up and just played that. Yeah. And there's just, there's that thing when you're like, oh, man, I'm grown as a player because you've obviously gotten past that point of playing on whatever the gear is. Well, I just right. get so excited when it's a cool instrument, even if it's a crappy instrument. Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends on what you want me to do at, in the moment. But... Um, I, you know, when there's a new sound and a new tone, and also this guitar happens to be one of the most beautiful guitars I've ever played. So uh, as soon as I picked it up, I was like, oh man, can I just play this a little bit longer? Um, but that's, you know, I, I get just get excited by, by different sounds and different instruments, which is also a bit of a curse, because when I'm on tour, I want to bring so many different things. But uh, uh, yeah. Well, the guitar changes you. That's what you were talking about, too. It yeah. actually changes you. Yeah. yeah. And it might be an inexpensive guitar. It might be hard to play. Yeah. And, and I've experienced that, too. Like, I'm too slick and polished of a player because that's how I made my living. And sometimes mm -hmm. a guitar like that will take some of that away, and it's better for me. Yeah, so I understand yeah. that. Yeah, I've been really, I mean, into this silver tone guitar in, in the studio just because, like, the same kind of thing. Just kind of, like, yeah. you have to wrangle, you have to wrestle with it. Yeah. You know, but I have a signature guitar, the D'Angelico, that's, that I, it's kind of my workhorse that I bring out on the road, and it's because it plays great, and it's it stays in tune, and, mm -hmm. it's, and it's it's really... It's consistent and fun to play, and but yeah, in the studio, I just love gra I just love mixing it up all the time. Well, I saw you play that guitar this week, okay, yeah. Yeah. and I noticed that it's, it appears to have P90s in it. Well, they're actually they're their own thing. It's a, it's it's similar to P90. It's it's a single coil like in a it's an Alnico Very cool. five in a in a humbucker casing. It was something we just kind of 
I, during the pandemic, we had some time to, yeah. to create that guitar. Um, I, I have it over there. I should probably bust it out. But Sounds the, good. It, it does sound yeah. really cool. Yeah. And I was like, you know, on, on this search for something that was in between an SG and a Strat, you know, and, uh, and like an early 60s Strat. So we tried all these different pickups at MJ at, at uh, Seymour Duncan. I was like, can you put a single coil but make it look, you know, like it fits in this guitar? And that's what she kind of came up with. We did three or four versions and we found one that just had the thing. And mm -hmm. I got really into fuzz pedals in, in the last few years and kind of like, um, I, I, that was the first thing I did when I picked up guitars. Like, how does it sound through like a couple of these fuzz pedals? And on the bridge pickup, does it have that that thing where it just kind of breaks up in that right way and kind of sputters? And Ooh, it had it. Awesome. It had it. So I was like, oh man, we got it. So uh, I'm really excited about the guitar. But it also, you know, it's one of those things where I'm on the road and I have one guitar. It kind of has that spank of a strat but that like soaring kind of singing SG thing too. So, mm -hmm. um, but it also just looks. Cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> it looks and That's it looks, like 50% it, of it. It, look, yeah. well, it looks I'm classic. Saying, even it's like a new yeah. guitar. I didn't yeah. want something that was like, oh, here's my version of a Strat or here's my version of an SG. I wanted something that looked unique. Well, check this out. I mean, uh, Paul Reed Smith is a friend of mine, and there are people who have prejudice you know, against his guitars because of the way they look or whatever. Yeah. So I had them make this, and it doesn't have the signature. Yeah. It just has a bird, and it doesn't have the birds on the neck. It just has the dots. And it's kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. It's meant to just kind of look mysterious, and then people eventually figure out what it is. Yeah. But it's so it's not that different than your D'Angelico yeah. that I saw you playing this week that you yeah. have here. Yeah. It's yeah. I, yeah. The black maybe guitar. I should, maybe I should. Yeah. Can I just grab it? Yeah. Is it okay if I just grab it? I'm trade with you. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of got this classic. There it is. Look, you know, but it's not really anything else. One thing I like is I, I often wish that these pole pieces were not Sorry so close that. to the bridge because. It sounds a little brash here, and it, yeah. you might have solved it by having them in the center like that. There it is, yeah, yeah. single coil sound. It kind of sounds different than you think it's going to sound by looking at it. Yeah. And fuzzes always sound better with single coil pickups. Yeah, that's always, always it's always been that way. I've, I've, that's law. why, that's how I got into it, because I always played hollow bot, semi hollow mm -hmm. humbucker guitars and I was never I never could get the fuzz sound to work. And then yeah. when I started using the single coil doing the single coil thing, I just was I, I got kinda addicted to it. Um, at least for soloing and stuff. So. Well like, now I have to ask uh, because I like your use of fuzz by the way. You have you have a little edginess. So what is a benchmark tone for you? Can you explain if you had to say what's a benchmark clean and sort of Breakup, like what is it? A fuzz is the Ambon Ten, and I kind of want to ask all three of you what, what are because you were saying something earlier, where I think in your head you think oh, I just sound like too much like this person or too much like that person. Mm -hmm. We don't hear that because it's filtered through you, mm -hmm. but you know what those are. So what, do you have some of those benchmarks that you're thinking like, oh, this is comfortable, but I might sound like this, or you just know that's what you like and. Like, w can you unravel that for me a little bit? Sure. I don't worry about that as much anymore. I did a lot of a lot at the beginning because I was always afraid that my, you know, someone was going to be like, hey, your influences are showing. Um, but I, I know for myself, because I play in such low tunings, that I need a certain amount of headroom um, on my amp, like an, a certain amount of um, clarity, <clears throat> and a certain amount of grit. And that sort of like distance between those two things is, is important and a little bit hard to achieve, um, especially in, in playing with bandmates because you know I'm always afraid of like blowing their heads off you know and sometimes it, it happens but it's it's like to, in order to find um, that certain sound sometimes that you have to like uh, certain like distortion pedals don't do it for me it feels like it like squeezes all of the headroom out of it um right now I've just been playing like a deluxe reverb amp so it's enough wattage for me to kind of like get it to that place where it's still um, clear when I when I hit it sort of at a certain, um, uh, you know, with a certain intensity, and then it breaks up right right when I need it to. Um, I, I usually have it on like five, five and a half. Oh, um, push it a little definitely, bit, Definitely, yeah. definitely pushing it. Or like probably more like four and a half if I'm honest. Um, and then yeah, <laughs> just have the, the artificial blonde pedal on and that usually like kind of helps it 
break up a little bit in the the marriage between those things kind of kind of works to to get it where I usually like it. I, I do have to ask you. Usually, there's a conflict between the stage volume of the guitar player and the singer, but you're the same person. On the stage. <laughs> usually, the singer's like, "Turn those guitars down. I can't hear on stage." Yeah. But you're the same person. So how do you juggle that? I still want to get to you guys' answer, but that's always been the mystery to me. Is like, if you're just a guitar player, like I can play as loud as I want, get my sound, and do whatever. But you still need to sing in tune and. How do you how do you wrestle that? Well, know? there's an argument within myself okay. over which one. <laughs> yeah, which one are you at yeah. that moment? I'm yeah. the guitar player. I, I have to sing now. Totally, and I, you know, I'm I'm always trying to figure out which one takes priority, singer or guitar player, and um, the answer is both, and that's a little a little a little tricky. Um, and I don't use in ears. I I just play off of wedges. So um, at this point, I feel very protective over my ears. And my voice; those are two perishable things. And um, so I've 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 tried to do the old like tr keep the amp at a reasonable volume and sort of turn other things up on my amp for to produce that sort of crunch um, and gain. And then sorry, on my pedal board is what I mean. Um, and then like pushing it through the monitors a little bit if I need it. But it's honestly an ongoing, if you figure it out, you let me know because I haven't figured out how to Well, how I to think we have a bunch of other friends who are like, should I go to in-ears? I like my wedges. I just like my Marshalls on 10. And it, it, <laughs> it, everybody's like, I still use wedges. And I was like, I got, it's, I don't think it's ever ending because the minute you have to start singing, on top of being a guitar player, those are two conflicting things. Totally. Yeah, trying to get a, a vibe to improvise in any sort of way on the guitar, I can't do it with ears. Yeah, I, I've, yeah. I've tried yeah. ears so many, yeah. I've gone back and forth so many times, because for singing, it's so great if you're in a loud band with a lot of members, but I still always go back to wedges if I want to play guitar and sound good. It's like totally. such a... a There's a couple, a couple of great subjects here. Um, I, I want to touch on one that you just brought up, which is hearing. I was born in 1958, so uh, my love of music comes from 60s songs on the radio and then classic rock in the late 60s. To me, the greatest sound became a Marshall 412 because you could literally feel the sound in your chest. And I got hooked on that. That's not good for your ears. Right. And it's just great that you're aware of protecting your hearing. Yeah. I mean, it's a really, really, really great thing. My tinnitus doesn't bother me that much. I'm okay. But it would have been so much better if I'd been able to, you know, not have it. Now, to your question, we all want yeah. the same thing. We all want a sound that's not compressed, and we want the amp to be at, you're talking about four and a half on your Princeton or Deluxe. That's where it sounds the best. It begins to bloom, mm. but it's not compressed. Yeah. And there's no pedal that you have on there that, com that squashes it down. Yeah. Everything has to stay open. I know you're the same way. Yeah. That's what we all want. And for me, that was Frederick's divided by 13 that he designed with Rusty Anderson. It's called the RSA 23. It's one amp. It's been one amp for me for the past 15 years. And I use other amps for stuff, but that's where it blooms in just the right place. And we just got that sound plugged into the aux, because you know what I like, and you got it yeah. for me. But sitting here, I only wanted it to be one of two people. I wanted it to be Neil Young or Stephen Stills in Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. That's yes. crazy, because I thought that's the Stephen guitar sound. I heard that, the Stephen Stills. I almost said something a minute yeah, ago see, when that, that see, was going it's on. Like, yeah. it's, it's, Who I there's a, love, you know, love. we all share some of the same voodoo. Yeah. And the one-note solos. Yeah. All totally. about one-note yeah. solos. Nothing better, and the chord changes underneath it, and then you're... Yeah. It's you're that, that <laughs> it induces yeah. chills yeah. and... Yeah. And it, yeah, it's minimalism at its at yeah. its finest. Yeah, and, and so a lot of guitar players just they just sh go so far past this beautiful stuff. But to me, it was like the guitar playing on Seals and Crofts, which was Louis Shelton, and then uh, Crosby, Seals, Nash and Young. And then I just thought of another record, Sean Colvin's a few a few small, a few small repairs. repairs is brilliant. That is that's brilliant. Record. If I could be yes. that guy for the rest of my life, mm -hmm. John those, Leventhal, I think is exactly. About. That's yeah. that's you know the archetype for me of who I want to be, you know, and it, it's based on other people too, but. When you, you say have, like, if I could be that guy, are you saying because you, you're just, you're in sessions and you're, you have to be a chameleon of sorts? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that's where it was like, oh, that's, that was the era when you could be, you could just make colors on the guitar around the songs. Songs are so different now as well. Exactly. Yeah. It's a totally different, you know, generation of songwriters and yeah. thinkers. That's so interesting. Tim, could, do you mind if I ask you about uh, just 
give us a little nugget of some of one of your favorite sessions or, or songs that you've been a part of? Well, the, there's a couple. The Crowded Houses Don't Dream It's Over is one of the greatest <sighs> songs I ever got to oh play on. And God. I was lucky to be there. You know, I did the color part, Neil did the rhythm part. And then the biggest one for me was Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls, because when that came out, I got to do the mandolin and the electric guitar solo on that. And when it came out for about 18 months, it was like the most played song. Wow. There's probably a couple others, too. But I think Don't Dream It's Over is one of the greatest, yeah, one yeah. of the greatest songs and recordings. It's so classic, man. So cool. But uh, wow. somebody asked me the other day, the nicest rock star was Rob Thomas, the nicest guy in the world for okay. a Smash Fox. Wow. Player. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's nice, but... Yeah. I mean, not everybody, right? Not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Not sure. everybody. They're nice, yeah. but they have to be nice to some yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of our favorite players and songwriters and bands all had an arc. You know, the Beach Boys sounded one way when they got signed, sounded a different way when they ended. Same thing with the Beatles. The Beatles we saw at the end wasn't the Beatles that was the start. And an artist is supposed to grow Absolutely. and explore and not look at Jeff Beck. He was not the same guitar player in 69 that he was in 75, that he was in 83, that he was in 99. And you're supposed to grow and learn new things. Why, why would you say the same the entire you know, length of your career? Well, and so, the, 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 the really the great place to be, and I think you guys are both headed there, you're not looking for hits, you're looking for an audience. Yep. No, I mean, that is an incredible distinction and no one's ever put it that way. It's like, you know, it's, it's pe people who put out hits, it's like, your audience is maybe only there for as long as the hit is like, you know, charting. Yeah, <laughs> and like Dave Matthews is the perfect example of, you know, that coming to fruition. It, it doesn't matter, it's just him and his audience. It's that way for both of you too. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, it sounds corny, but the secret is always making the stuff you love and, and impressing yourself yeah. and hoping that your, the, your fans are in line with that. You know? Yeah. That's, as somebody said to me recently, and it, it's, I don't know if I exactly buy it, but he said, disappoint your audience. You have to disappoint your audience. Yeah, that's an easy thing to say, yeah. but you really can't, I mean, what he meant by that is make sure you're being true to yourself. Totally. Um, but it's not that simple. It's never that simple. No. Yeah, you feel, I'm, I would imagine if you really felt like you disappointed the people who have like helped you build your career, yeah. that you would feel um, some guilt about that. Yeah. <laughs> Doing yeah. things for yourself never feels totally, um, you know, carefree. Yeah. But yeah, I, I stand by that. I stand by like, you know, being willing to, to lose a couple of people in way of trying yeah. to do Moving something forward. that helps you find yourself right. and find the heartbeat behind yeah. why you started music in the first place. Yeah. Or, yeah, that's yeah. No and one's whether, that for you. Whether it's successful or not, you're the one that's going to have to play these songs for a long time and many, many times. Totally. <laughs> so that's always my it. rebuttal. Like, if yeah. I feel I'm, like I'm getting pushed into something, I'm always like, yeah, yeah Wait but a second. you don't have to be the face <laughs> yeah. of this. Yeah. Yeah. Easy for you to say. Yeah. I have a question for you. I remember this about being on the road. I always felt it was like my duty to take care of everybody else and be there for everybody else. Do you guys find that when you're on the road that you really want to try and make sure everybody on the team is doing okay? <laughs> that depends. Ah. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I mean, yes, I, the, the generally, yes. If it's my own, so I, I have a few, I know Madison pretty much you tour uh, is your own. I, I tour on my own, but I also tour with other yeah. People, and then I, I've been in so many, I've been in bands, you know, I was in Soul Live for, I mean, we still are a band, but we, you know, toured for 20 years, and, um, you know, there's just different levels, then more recently, I, my band, I had like a six-piece band out on the road for about a year and a half, and, you know, some of them were like younger guys, and I definitely felt like the dad in that situation, right. and <laughs> wanting to make sure everyone was comfortable, because at the end of the day, it was my name on the thing and I want to, yeah. you know, there's there's another level of pressure to that versus being in a band where it's like, okay, you know, whatever happens here, it's all three of us or it's all five of us and, you know, um, but, and I and I love leading a band and, I, but it, there, it is a lot harder um, than being part of a, part of a band, part of a band where everyone has this kind of equal, um, say in things which can be mm. complicated but also mm. you know if, if if things go wrong it's it's going wrong for all of us it's not yeah. just the one guy <laughs> so uh yeah it depends on the it depends on the setting okay so i learned a little bit about how you set your gear up now so my question is grabbing the knob behind you the volume 
lower or higher at those things, you, how, how would you play differently with that setting? And I'm curious, because uh, I've noticed you, you obviously don't play with a pick very much, or maybe at all. Mm. I, I, I do it's both at both, times. Yeah. But at least today you're not doing the pick, and you have a very percussive where every note counts as far as the groove, hmm. which is really hard to maintain. And there are a few players and friends of mine that can do that, one being Charlie Hunter who can play bass and guitar at the same time. He's this whole thing. Wow. Or a B3 player can play bass in that. You, I see you as really, I see two sides of your brain going on on the guitar. Hmm. You've got this thing here and you're grabbing other things. Hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, how does the amp respond cleaner or dirtier? Do, do you change your playing style? And can we see a couple examples of that? Sure. Because um, I think the amp is maybe at four and a half, five right now, not too hot. But when it's crunchier, it's it's not crazy hot, but there's definitely like when I dig in and give more power, um, you know, from picked strings, I it crunches, and I feel like I can let certain notes just like you know. There's like a lot of power in oh, that. That's, that's great, yeah. Feeling, and I, I, I guess that's sort of the, the arc of a show that I'm always trying to achieve, is to get to that moment where you're like, here comes the one note solo, right. because she feels that there's enough crunch on, you know, on the amp, and I think this, this pedal achieves that, or this amp, I should say, achieves that kind of instantaneously, like when we were just playing a little bit ago, I felt the freedom to not have to to like overly play because the tone was happening oh. and like no amount of notes can compensate for bad tone you know mm -hmm. so that yeah it's and then i mean if it if it was cleaner i'd pro I'd probably get a little more percussive you know oh, yeah. um, so like turning the volume down makes it a little bit yeah. cleaner so yeah now now i'd probably you know uh let's see You know what I mean? Like, it feels like there's oh. a little bit more um, headroom for for the notes to to sing individually, and so I'd probably go a little more percussive there. Um, well, you just said a whole lot by just playing for us. Yeah, that was great. And, that, and what yeah. you said about the tone allowing you to make, you know, maybe more thoughtful choices and playing less notes. Yeah. Yes, I think that's such an important statement. Like for me, when my tone is right. I'm thinking more melodically, I can play less, I feel less pressure to, right. to fill the space, you mm. know. I, I, one of the things that, you know, whenever I listen back to like live recordings of myself, I never s ever have said I should have played more. It's <laughs> yeah, always right. I should have played less, right. always 100% oh, of the time, so right? That, yeah. And that's one of the reasons. It's like I, when, I, when my tone is right, I'm gonna play less, I'm gonna play more, make everything count more. Well, the tone know? carries you. Yeah. It carries you. Exactly. It's giving you more than you're giving it, even if it's right. Right. If it's right, it's giving you back more. Usually when I'm trying to play more, the thought that goes through my head is like, who are you trying? Who are you playing for? <laughs> right, this isn't right, for you. You're miserable. Right. That person's judging me. I'm not playing enough. Yeah. Yeah. Playing in front, I can see yeah. them. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Well, your playing is very dynamic. I see you purposely playing low, hitting a hard. It, it, there's a, an arc to your playing, even within the parts. Within, yeah. Mm. Within yeah. The, where where I, I can see if you had too much distortion, it would all just be this giant mess. Mm -hmm. As I see you yes. purposely hitting a sharp note here, even doing the. Yeah. I think you actually did that earlier. Yes, when you you yes. just go for that random sort of thing. And those are the fine details that mean you just, that's not even a chord. That's just like, I'm going to put that there. <laughs> well, it's a you know? dynamic style. Yeah. And this pedal doesn't compress at all. It's totally open. So I know what you want. You want some notes to be like this and others to be like this yeah. and everything in between. Yeah. And if, you, if, if the amp, we'll, we'll call it an amp. Yeah, let's Allows you to do, do that, then you're there. You're there. Yeah, dynamics are so important, you yeah. know. It's it's dynamics are the thing that like fills this sort of range of emotion too. Absolutely. Um and I think, you know, to have something that allows you to fill that space or or not fill that space, it's um it's the, it's everything, you know. Right. And I, I want to say the same thing with Eric. It's, it's obviously you have no pedals in front of you or drives and you weren't really using any overdrive pedals right now either. So it was all about the dynamics of your hand and maybe even just rolling the volume down to clean it up. Yeah. yeah. Which is very much, I think, where where Tim, you would have started with, you put a Marshall on 
eight. That's seven. how we did it. We, we rolled down the volume knob and we fattened it up however we could. And yeah, yeah you'd make your Marshall clean or dirty. And you play harder, play lighter, lighter, roll it down. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So I see that in your playing and also the way you manipulate the guitar. And, and I say that's, you, you did the move where you got no pedal board and you're just, you're going with it. Yeah. And very mm -hmm. similar to what Madison's doing, yeah. you know, and there, that takes a lot of, um, well, if, uh, let me put it this way. A really great amp sound does make you feel a little invincible. Like, yes. like, oh man, like I can play anything. And there are nights I've had friends say like, this was my best night ever. I could play, I felt like I was playing stuff I never could have got away with before. Mm. And I've had other friends go, this was a terrible night. And you see it on their face where like their rig's not sounding good. Yep. And you see them shutting down during the gig like, oh, they're mad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's not like it's, I hate to say this too, you know, uh, it should be a tool. The tone's there as a tool to make you put music out in the world and hopefully the tools don't distract you. Yeah. So that's, I think, as a designer, when you were talking about songwriting, that's an isolating experience because you're doing stuff that's inside and I feel like even designing gear is the same way. You work on something in a cave for a couple of years. <laughs> And all of a sudden you're like, don't take this away from me. I'm not ready for it to go out in the world. <laughs> and you have to get used to people. To It becomes theirs. Yeah. And they do something great with it. Just like when you write a song, you write this great part. Somebody else, they wrap that in there and it's theirs now. Well, he did it. We were at Sunset Sound. We did a shootout. He had the, the perfect Fender, the perfect box, and the perfect, with well, the other Fender, the two Fenders, right, right? Right, So he turned it into the Ruby, the Woodrow, and the Dream. And you should have been there. The actual real amps were there, and then he had on the fader these pedals. We couldn't tell the difference. We That's kept mistaking crazy. one for the other. You did it. Yeah. yeah. And That's true incredible. story, when I plugged in at my studio, and I have a 65 Super and a 69 Vibra Lux in the live room there, and, uh, and I plugged it in just to, try, just to try it, and I haven't unplugged it since, which is a true story. These guys wow. came over. I was still plugged in, and uh, just because instantly the tones were there. And that's the thing also, like, there's so many options with it, but it's still simple. And that to me is crucial. And we talked about this earlier. You know, you don't want a, like this large divide between like plugging in and then getting inspired. You want, you want it to be yeah. simple and easy. And uh, mm -hmm. I found it to be like easy, easy to work with, but like super inspiring to play through. And um, you know, the fact that, it, that I haven't plugged into those amps in a few weeks is... <laughs> I can give you my testament. address, we'll put the amps in my house. Uh, <laughs> I'll take for, now, I will say for all three, the interesting thing was, and maybe you did it when I wasn't looking, but you plugged into the Marshall. I think I put the knobs where I guessed you might like them. Didn't touch it. And I don't think you touched them once, yeah. No. It's there, it was there. You know, we, uh, we all... Th we all kind of want the same thing. We all want the same thing, the yeah. same thing. I think, yeah. I, I go, yeah. I'm gonna guess. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, that's fine. And then I don't think you would, you, you might have not touched anything. Didn't yeah, even question, I haven't touched but, anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but that, I think that also translates to players who are experienced enough to know, like, nope, this is, works for me. Time to make me. Mm -hmm. Well, that wouldn't happen yeah. everywhere. It's you. James. No, I'm just very lucky <laughs> because when you work yeah. with players of your level, yeah. you know when there's a time like, that's, that's what I need. It's time to open that part of yeah. your brain that's like, time to make music. Yeah. And, and I hope there's, uh, with this stuff that you're not constantly looking at, like, I wish, ah, it's not right. Because that's the most mm -hmm. discouraging thing ever when you play through something, you're like, this should be amazing, but I don't want to play this and I sound bad. Mm -hmm. And you start down in your playing and you feel that. So hopefully, at least for me today, it was great to see you all roll up, immediately start playing. Yeah. And because that's kind of what it's all about. It doesn't, it's not about the speed of a processor or the technology. It's about, can you plug in, move a knob and start playing guitar? Because that's all I want to do is play guitar. Well, on, yeah. on those old mm -hmm. Motown sessions, they had three guitar players. I get that yeah. today. It's like, cause you, yeah. you, you can always find space. You come in, come out. Yeah. Totally. It's wonderful. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. And Thanks for having me. It's cool to be a part of this. We could, we could do this tomorrow too. Down. <laughs> Every day. We'll bring more toys <laughs> over and we'll, we'll do another round. Done.
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fun. Great. That was amazing. Yeah. Right on. Thank you guys. This was a wonderful way to end the day. Yeah.